Kilim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yes, thank you for coming. Kilim, we just read your bio. And can you please just tell us a little bit more? You are from England and now you live in the States. Is that correct? And uh, what are you guys doing here? Tell us more about it. That is definitely the plan, yes. Yeah. So I'm actually still over in England at the moment, but we are in the process of going through the moves. And yeah, I work with a company called Landtech. We are initially at a UK business, but we've launched now in the US. And I take on the role of trying to take our revenue operations over from the UK to the US and then start selling our products into the US market. So it's been a lot of fun so far. But you're telling me that you had land tech in the UK first. That's right. Yes. I first joined the business in the very early days of land tech in the UK. So it was our two co-founders, a software engineer and me back in 2016. And over about a six year period, we grew the business up to a, a good size. We raised a 50 million pound funding round in 2021. And the purpose of that funding round was to take us over to the US and, and help us build a business out here. That's where we are now. The last couple of years have been busy building and developing something to take to the market. Yes, you are offering a very interesting uh, product. There is definitely nothing like what you're doing in the market that I have seen. So just a little bit of background to our listeners. There is dirt, land, raw land. And then there is a process that takes place in order to get permits to be able to build something. And that process can be pretty intense, expensive, and timely if even before you even put a shovel on the ground. And there is a lot of information that you need in order to decide where are you going to spend your money and your time? Where, what piece of dirt will give you the business that you're looking for? So their product, Land Tech, is exactly the tool that will give you all that information. Can you tell us more, a little bit more about that, Caleb? For sure. Yeah, it's, that sums it up pretty well. We are creating a platform to help real estate developers, brokers, anyone that's in the market that's looking to try and get in early with a piece of land and directly with a landowner rather than necessarily just buying something that, that's listed on the market. And we want to be able to provide people with access to all of the hard to find data about that piece of land at the click of a button so they can see who owns that property, how is it zoned, what's the future land use. Is there any permits that have been pulled there? Is there any hazards or wetlands that might impact mm -hmm. what I wanted to do with it? And all of these things exist, but it takes time to navigate from one to the other, lots of different places to get to. So if we can simplify that and put it in one place, that saves our, our customers a lot of time. And then the real advantage of having that in one place means you can actually search through that information. So I can come into the system and I can say, I want to find anything that's between 10 and 40 acres, which is zoned for a particular use, could be single family or, or agricultural or whatever it is that you're, you're looking for in, in that instance, which has been owned for a certain period of time, which isn't too impacted by hazards. And it will give you a list of those potential opportunities. So yeah, the idea is it could be dirt, could be a piece of land. It could be an existing building that you wanted to, to target. So it's not strictly limited to vacant land, but it's anyone in the real estate industry that's looking for opportunity, really. My blood is boiling because I spent months last year going through the county's websites, trying to understand their current zoning, and then trying to understand where the future land use is. Because this is the other thing, folks. If you're not in this business, you need to realize that Sometimes, for instance, here in Florida, in Hillsborough County, where uh, close to where we live, let's say that there is certain amount of land that is going to be preservation land. We want to keep that as just raw land that is going to be as a buffer for our communities. Now, there is other areas where the jurisdiction, the county, wants to allow some 
buildings to come. They have already designed what the layout is going to be. We want single family homes here, and then we want some apartments here, and then we want some industrial here, and then we want some retail here. Anyways, they have compiled all the data for the future land use in one place. And you guys are the only ones doing that. Yeah, as far as we've seen, we're the only ones that kind of are are doing that and pulling it together with these kind of other data pieces. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's what we're really good at is finding hard to find difficult data, kind of putting it through our data engine and simplifying it and putting it on a map in a standardized way. Because this is the other thing. When you go from one county to another, zoning codes are different. So unless you know what you're looking for, it can be a minefield even trying to find out what that means and yeah, what's single family, what's multifamily, what's commercial, what's industrial. So we try and simplify all of that, color code it. You can just scroll across the map, across the state, and it makes sense of all that data just by looking at it. So yeah, it's a big job and we haven't seen anyone else doing it just yet. And that's probably why maybe we're nuts for giving it a go. And on that point, one more thing, Caleb. Every county has a different website style and software. So you're going from an AT county, which is pretty rudimentary. That website must have been built in the 1920s. I'm just kidding. It is that horrible. And then you go to Hillsborough County. It's a pretty decent website. But then you go, to, that is just, oh, anyways, I stop. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah, like each county has their own things. You mentioned about hazards. A lot of people don't understand. They think, oh, it's land. What kind of hazards could it be? Can you touch a little bit on those hazards? Yeah, for sure. I think particularly in the Florida market, flood risk and wetlands are Mm -hmm. things that you really have to be careful about. You don't need to speak to many people in the industry to know that insurance is a hot topic at the moment. It's difficult to get properties insured in Florida and where you sit in regards to these flood zones and these wetlands are going to have an impact on the insurance cost or whether you can even get that insured. In certain places, you just won't be able to do it. In terms of those key hazards in Florida, that's something that we can map out. So straight away, you can stick that layer on. And if you're assessing a property or a piece of land, it will immediately show you whether or not there's any of those considerations that you need to take into account before you think about moving forward with a purchase. A lot of people confuse those two things, flood zone and wetlands. What is the difference? Can you define that? Because people think it's the same thing. Sure. So I think the, the key difference there really is flood zones are areas which are potentially liable to flooding, and they will usually give you a percentage risk on how likely that is. There's different categories of it. I think if you go right down to the lowest category, pretty much the whole of Florida has some level of Mm -hmm. flood risk, but it's a pretty flat day. But when you get to the higher levels, those are the things that the insurance companies are really looking at. So it doesn't mean that they're wet. If you were to walk past it, you wouldn't notice anything. It would just look like any other area, but they might have a higher propensity to potentially flood if there's heavy rains or if there's issues with flooding in the area, it could be that it's near an existing waterway, a river or a canal or something like that. Whereas a wetland is exactly that. A wetland is something which is wet on the ground. It's a lake, it's a river, it's a swamp, it's a something, but it's there and it's wet right now. So those areas you can't build on. If there's wetlands, you can't build on top of a lake. If that will impact the buildable area of the land that you're looking at. If there's wetlands in there, you'll have to factor that into what you can actually build on. Caleb, I'd like to take a moment here, just pause it for a minute from talking about the actual software. Can you share with us, with the normal peoples, the mortals, how did that idea came about of creating this software? Because when I'm having a beer with Lydia or when I'm just like chit-chatting, I don't think about Let's create a software that is going to have all these data. And so what is the backstory? I guess that's my question. It's a good question. It it actually all started with a tweet. So this would have been back in around 2015, maybe late 2014. Our co-founder, Andrew, he is a software engineer. He comes from a technical background on, on that side of things rather than a real estate background. He was trying to think about buying a 
a piece of land in and around London to build himself a house. So he wanted to build himself a house. He started trying to find out where he would walk around in Shoreditch. If you've been into London, certainly if you were in London in, in that kind of time, there was parts of Shoreditch where you'd find these kind of patches of just empty land around. And it's quite close to the city. So surprising to see a lot of that has now been built on. But at the time he was thinking, oh, I'll just buy that and I'll build myself a house there and that'll be great. And it was only from him trying to find out who owns it, what can you do with it, all of the information that we now provide in the platform, he realized it was really difficult to get to. So the initial idea was actually a, designed as a platform for self-builders. So if you or I wanted to build a house, Andrew's idea was that he would compile all of this information that you would need to know on what you're on the land that you might want to buy and put it in one place for self-builders. He tweeted about it and the other co-founder, Johnny, saw that tweet and Johnny had a background in town planning and they met up and had some conversations and the business was born from that. And in the early days, they realized quite quickly that the, although there are self-builders, there is a market out there for self-builders. Actually, the real estate developers had the same problems with finding the information as the self-builders did. And there was a much larger market there. And of course, the other good thing is self-builders would only ever want to use our product once. You buy it, you build a house and that's it. You never need yep. to use our services again. Whereas real estate developers are always looking for the next opportunity, always looking for the next site. It made more commercial sense for us to pivot and focus on that market. Yeah, that was around the time that I joined once they'd made that decision and, and started building out the product in the UK. And what is your background? How do you know them? So my background has, has mostly always been in, in real estate. I was, I was what we were in the UK, we'd call an estate agent, which is a realtor in, in US terms for five or six years when I was in my early to mid twenties. So I did that for a while. I did a few land transactions while I was doing that as well. And I had a real interest in development. I moved from there into a executive search headhunting company where I was working specifically on senior roles in land and development in and around the London area. So I built up a really strong network of, of developers and agents and people that work in that space just through kind of the uh, headhunting side and the recruitment side. And yeah, I, that was how Johnny ended up reaching out to me. He asked me if I could introduce him to anyone that buy the land. So I made a few introductions to people that, that I knew. And then he asked me if he knew anyone that might want to come and start trying to sell his new product. And I thought it looked too good to get someone else the job. So I, 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 I said to him that I'd be interested and we had a chat and that was that. So yeah, it was very serendipitous. I think sometimes it's funny how the decisions that you make, uh, throughout different kind of courses of your life lead you to lead you down different paths. And I'm definitely glad I, uh, made those decisions and had that chat with Johnny back then. I tell you, it's, it's not news. For instance, Lydia and I, we're part of a multifamily group and we both realized that we probably want to do capital raising within the multifamily space. But Lydia was always busy with her brokerage and her business. And then we had a hurricane come last year. Its name was Ian. And then I approached her again and she says, Mina, my offices blew up. I think I can join you on the, on the podcast. And I'm like, really? Anyways, that's, yeah, that's the story. It's just funny how those things work out. I wanted to ask you, Caleb, what nuances or what difference do you find between U.S. and England when it comes to land development? So there are some fairly... On the face of it, there are some quite big differences. In the US, obviously, zoning is generally what will dictate what you can and can't build on a certain piece of land or in a certain area. The zoning codes are there. You can apply for rezoning or to change the zoning. It's quite a long process and some companies seem to be willing to take that on and others aren't. In the UK, we have something similar which is planning policy, which again designates what you can and can't build somewhere, but planning policy doesn't go to the same level of detail as zoning. So there may be areas which are within the settlement boundary and not everywhere will be zoned. So in the UK, you just have to put in a planning application for whatever you want to build. And uh, 
hope that the the people that you submit it to are receptive to it and goes well. And it's a very convoluted process, I think. There's lots of local politics that get involved. There are precedents that are set within planning policy, which mean that in theory, if you follow the policy, you should be able to get something through. But we hear stories all the time of developers who submit planning applications that are 100% policy compliant, and then it gets refused at planning, and they have to go through a long appeal process to get it through. But it was interesting from having the conversations that I've had in the last six months or so, there are a lot more similarities than I initially thought with the two markets. Deals are often structured in a similar way and even called the same thing. So option agreements are quite common in, in the UK with a contingency in place on getting planning permission. And we've seen that a lot in the same thing in the US with contingency on rezoning or contingency on, on getting rezoning through. But the, the major difference that you see is just the scale of the market and how big the states and the country is. It's the UK is a fraction of the size of the US, of course. I think we looked at it the other day and even just in the Florida market, there's more property developers than there are in the whole of the UK. So it's a, a much bigger market to, to try and tackle. But I've got one good stat, which is in the UK, we have over 300 local authorities and, and for us, the local authorities mm -hmm. is like a county. That's what will dictate the, the planning policy. And I think if you wanted to cover the United States, there's 19,000 counties to cover. So lots of, lots of data for us to scrape and aggregate and get onto a map by if we want to cover the whole of the US. So that's the plan. So yeah, we've got some work cut out. Work cut out. <laughs> Tell us about that, Caleb. So you completed England. Then you move to a bigger market, the U.S. You're starting in Florida. And so what is the goal? Are you really trying to cover the whole country? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the intentions. We want to get to the point where we'll have national coverage across the U.S. Some of the data sets that we have, we already have national coverage. We don't have that in the platform just yet, but the, the data that we have, once we acquired it, it, it already covered the whole country, other data sets, we have to go at a county at a time or, or an MSA at a time. So there's, there's definitely lots of work to be done, but we're in Florida for now. Right now we are in the process of deciding which states will be next when we start to roll things out and we expect to roll data out in, into some new states in the early part of next year. I'm finding it really exciting at the moment. The conversations that we're having now, the reactions that we see when we show people the product remind me a lot of the early days when we did this in the UK. So giving us lots of confidence, shaping up to be a good end of the year for us. And I'm really excited about getting out to the US and moving out there and seeing what we can achieve in 2024 and beyond. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. You find a need in the market and then you take on the responsibility of finding a solution for that need. Yeah. And then you take on the responsibility of taking money from certain folks to apply it for that solution. And then you bring it to the market. At that point, you spend time, effort, tears, money, everything into those projects. And then you just hope it's going to work right. You were right at the beginning. That is a real need. And really, I salute you for that. Yeah. So I want to ask you this, why yes. did you choose yes. United States and Florida, start with Florida from all the other states and all the other places? So there were a few factors that, that went into that. We did a good amount of research and, and looked at lots of different options before we made the decision to go with Florida. This was, the research was done back in mm -hmm. 2020, 2021, when we first raised the money. And it was obvious at that point that the market in Florida was just exploding. There was an enormous amount of inward migration with people flocking to the state. And it seemed the real estate developers that we'd spoken to out there were really excited about what was happening in the market. So those were the major driving factors. It also helps mm -hmm. that Florida's on the East Coast. So the time difference between the UK and, and Florida is not so drastic as if we mm -hmm. picked a state on the West Coast. And hey, it's, there's lots of sunshine as well, which helps a lot, right? I think coming over from the UK, nice to pick somewhere that, that beats our weather and Florida yeah, certainly does awesome. that. that's awesome. That's true. Sunshine. You can beat sunshine because you guys are very rainy and you don't get the sunshine. 
That's very true. I believe I heard somewhere, I was just trying to look it up, that there was nothing going on in Florida before air conditioner was readily available. If you look at the population in Florida, it used to be just the natives Mm -hmm. and the Cubans or the Latin people that would just immigrate to the States. And then air conditioner was more readily available. And Florida started slowly but surely attracting all those folks from up north where there is all the snow and the really cold weather. And we call those folks snowbirds. So they started coming seasonally to Florida. Now, what happened in 2020, and no wonder you chose Florida, is that the government, the state government, kept pretty much open through the whole COVID And it just attracted so many people and it continues to, they are continuing. This is 2023 and we continue to get the income, the 1,000 folks a a day Mm -hmm. coming to Florida. And now we are seeing that it's creating, there is a little bit of a shock in this system because we don't have enough waitresses. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough houses. The roads is a big mm-hmm. deal in Florida. We don't have enough roads. And anyways, when it's really interesting to be here and to be a witness of what's happening. Definitely. Have you noticed a big difference in all of that stuff living in Florida oh, yeah. the last few years with people coming in, the traffic and Oh boy, Just yeah, I've been people. living in the United States since 1990. Let me tell you something, like each year, I feel like more and more people are coming and moving to Florida. So yeah, definitely. I've seen a huge change and a huge change of infrastructure, a huge change of building and everything. There is actually a very good website called howmoneywalks.com. It takes immigration from different, from the United States, from what state and what zip code people move into, what zip code. And it's based from the IRS filing. It is a year behind, but you can actually see when you pull up which states are green, more people are moving in from what state. So, you know, each zip code has its own. We have a lot of people from New York, True. a lot of people from Ohio. It's Each zip code has its own demographic that's moving in and the injection of the money that's coming into Florida. Yeah. Mina, I had an interesting experience the other day. I was showing properties to a family with two kids and we had 10 to see. After viewing about half, the family was getting pretty hungry and they really just wanted to continue the other day. So what did you do? I went to my car and pulled out a bag of delicious Ricky Jerky. They loved it so much they were able to continue our day without any issues. All the ingredients are 100% natural, plus every strip is seasoned marinated and smoked by hand to give you the best experience and slap you back into the gear. But I need to buy some more. Oh, just head over to rickysjerky.com and use the discount code, the code REI, for 15% off your first order. So whether you're a busy real estate agent or just looking for mouth-watering snack on the go, Ricky Jerky, Jerky got, got you covered. covered. I'll yes, check it out. It Sounds interesting. And this is what we hear yeah. from builders all the time is they want to follow the jobs. Correct. They want to follow where people are moving mm-hmm. and they want to follow the jobs and, and that's where they want to find the next So site. who would use your product besides, you, you mentioned builders, who else? Who's your ideal person that you want this product to be used? For us, it could be builders or developers, multifamily or single family. It's, it's predominantly okay. residential led. So we, we tend to target residential developers. Well, we include multifamily in that. That comes under mm-hmm. commercial, I think, quite often in, in terms of zoning. But we see them as, as residential because they're, they're building things for people to live in. Any brokers that work in that space, so anyone that's looking to broker land deals, we, we speak to a lot of those, those types of people as well. Those are our kind of core customers. Outside of that, there are lots of fringe use cases. So anything in the commercial space, we've spoken to storage developers. We've spoken to, I mean, we spoke yesterday about the sourcing sites for storage use and things along those lines. So we people that are looking for that kind of stuff or specific commercial uses as well. So really the way we tend to describe it is it's anyone that is looking for uh, real estate opportunities for redevelopment that wants to kind of source land directly or source buildings directly, or even just save time on the underwriting process, because that's the other piece of it. 
And then that's the interesting thing we find in the UK is we have two very distinct use cases. One is the land finding. So some people use it for land finding predominantly, and that's why they sign up. And the other side of it is for people who want to save time on the underwriting process and be able to get to a yes or a no quicker, because a lot of time and effort goes into that. And if we can cut that time down, then you can spend a lot more time on high value work, which is really where people are, are best, their, their time is best spent. I was very impressed that we were able to pull up in a little five mile radius, 15 properties that could work for self-storage. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> oh, okay. So anyways, I am very excited about this software, the product. I can't wait to share it with folks. I and mean, seriously, two questions. Okay, Lam. what are some of your favorite features of land tech? And second, how long do you think it's going to take you guys to go over to the next state and then the next state and then the next state? So I would say my favorite features are the, the multi-criteria search. So we rolled that out in August of this year. So it's still pretty new, but it allows you to build out all of the criteria that you might want to look for in a land or a property search. So what's the size of the lot? Well, how is it zoned? What permitted uses are you looking for? How long has the current owner owned it? What year was the property built? That stuff's really helpful, especially if you're trying to target slightly older buildings on large lots. So yeah, multi-criteria search is, is uh, my current favorite feature. And in terms of the next states and that rollout, we are doing some work at the moment to decide which states are going to be next. We've had lots of input and feedback from different people about what that might be. And I expect we'll have data in one of, in a new state by the end of the year, by the end. So we're in October now, by the end of December, I think we'll be live in at least one other state. Um, although I think our approach is going to be more of an MSA led approach where we're not necessarily going to take on the whole of the next state that we look at, but we'll, we'll pick out which are the key MSAs in this state that we feel is the biggest demand. And we'll, we'll cover the data there and then we'll do the same in, in a few different states. So. I would hope that by the end of the first quarter of next year, we have that coverage in two or three other states outside that of Florida. That makes sense because not everything is buildable. I um, just want to thank you so much for giving us some time to talk about it. I want to share this with my group of people. We learned how to develop raw land to bring it to the marketplace. So this is definitely a tool that is well you guys got yeah. it down. We you were... guys got it down. You covered all the angles. It looks like you guys became very efficient at finding the land because instead of wasting a lot of time, it's going to cut your time and be more productive. Before I let you go, Caleb, can you tell us about, it is also a CRM within this software. Tell us a little bit about that too, please. Sure. Yeah. So there is a CRM element that lives on the back end of our websites. They're kind of two parts of the app. There is a map based app, which is where you would do all your land searching. This is where you would find the properties. But from there, you can save anything that you're looking at, any lot, any parcel of land, any property that you, that you find interesting. And then that will save it into your site's pipeline. And this site's pipeline looks a bit like a Trello board if you've ever used that. But once you click on any address, it will pop up with a almost like a resume for that piece of land. It'll give you all of the data, the zoning, the hazards, the permits, the future land use, the comparable sales nearby. And it allows you to add notes, add reminders, download reports, attach files. And it allows you to create a database which stays up to date. We found when we first built this in the UK that many of our customers would save all of their historic records, either, either just in their emails or in an Excel file. And that Excel file, as soon as you put the data in, the next day, potentially that's out of date if something changes and you're not going and checking it and updating it. Because we will do all that for you. It helps you stay up to date. And we're starting to get to the point in the US now where we can start to notify you if there's changes which open up new searches or new sites in a search you've done. Yeah, this is the, the kind of direction of travel is that will start to do some, do a lot of that work proactively for you if there's zoning changes and now all of a sudden there's new sites available in an area that you were searching that weren't previously 
suitable for what you were looking for, it will prompt you and tell you that stuff. And we're just That's going awesome. live with that this week. It's incredible. I love it. Can't wait to use it more. I just got my subscription yesterday and I hope I can become an expert because it's something that we've been needing for a long time. Kim, thank you so much for coming. I know it was short notice. You're welcome to come back any other time and we wish you the best. Yes. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. And if anyone wants to reach out, please feel free to connect on LinkedIn or, or book a demo awesome. on the link that yes. we share. Yes, oh, that reminds me. How else can they find you? Sorry, Caleb. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Callum Tansley on LinkedIn. And yes, I, I've shared a link with you, which is my meeting invite. So if anyone wants to have a look at the product, feel free to book directly in there and That's I'll run great. you through it. Thank you. I was so excited. Yeah, <laughs> me too excited. You. forgot yeah. to ask for, yeah.